Good afternoon and welcome to the Ground Zero Cafe. I'm Vanessa gomez Brake, the Associate Dean of Religious and Spiritual Life here at USC. Well, it's such a joy to have you all here. We are definitely in for a treat, as today we will be hearing from a beloved member of the School of Cinematic Arts, Mariano Elapano. This speaker series represents a creative solution to an important problem in the university setting the separation of intellectual life from the personal and the spiritual. What Matters to Me and Why offers the Trojan family an opportunity to hear from USC faculty and administrators in a different way. Rather than lecturing on their area of expertise or their research, we invite speakers to share their life journeys with us. So once a month during this Wednesday lunch hour, we get to listen in as they reflect on their values, their beliefs, and motivations that have shaped their lives. If you would like to nominate a member of the USC community to speak at a future event, please visit our website, that's ORSL for Office of Religious and Spiritual Life, .usc.edu. Additionally, you can visit our website to view recordings of many of our past speakers. The video from today's event will also go up on YouTube um, later in the week. Before we begin our program, I'd like to just highlight a few upcoming events that I'm excited about this semester. Tomorrow night at the University Religious Center, which is just across the street from SCA, um, our Native American Student Union will be welcoming Sivan Aldera Rose to campus. That name may sound familiar because she is the first Native actress to be in a leading role of a Netflix series. So join the students at the URC tomorrow night, 7 p.m., as they show clips from the first episode of Chambers, then engage Sivan in a conversation on her work. Yes, there will be popcorn. <laughs> and next week, for National Coming Out Day, we'll be partnering with the LGBT Resource Center and the Interfaith Council on Thursday, October 10th. At 7 p.m., again, free food, Indian dinner this time. Um, and we'll have a panel of religious leaders. These are representatives of Baptist, Jewish, atheists, and other Los Angeles communities. They'll engage students in a conversation about the intersections of identity and spirituality. All Trojans are welcome to National Coming Out Day. And probably one of the most exciting events we have coming up, Harry Potter as Sacred Text. On Thursday, October 24th, again at the URC Fishbowl, we'll have a night of nerdy conversations, compl complicating great characters and personal reflection. This will be an overtly feminist space where we will spend a little time celebrating the women of Harry Potter. Join us as we explore what it means to treat something as sacred, to live a life of meaning, and to sustain our Ourselves on the things we already love, Harry Potter. And of course, that will be, um, it's one of the top two podcasts on iTunes right now, and so the two leading ladies of the podcast will be leading us in a reflection as Harry Potter and Sacred Text. All right, so that's it for the month of October, but if you want, you can sign up for our newsletter and hear about other awesome events that are coming up this semester. So I believe there are still some sandwiches. Feel free to go back for seconds, but um, sit back and relax and be prepared to ask a question of our speaker. Um, after we hear from Mariano, we'll take about 10 minutes at the end for you to do a Q&A with him. And I do ask that you raise your hand. We have a microphone that will be going around and that will make it easier for everyone to hear you clearly. So today, to introduce Mariano Elapano, a longtime colleague of his from the SCA Division of Animation and Digital Arts was invited to join us. So please help me in welcoming Professor Christine Panushka to the stage. This was a surprise for Mar. So, uh, Mar, I was thinking of him as Mar is for marvelous, and that's certainly true. Uh, Mar is our production supervisor of the John C. Hench Division of Animation and Digital Arts, and that means he kind of shepherds all the films for the students, 
And not only does he take care of them, if you look back at our archive of student films, Mar's name will be on every single one of them, often with huge, thank you, Mar, thank you, Mar, lots of exclamation points, because he truly helps them get through the maze of the cinema school and be able to complete their um, dream projects. But he also takes care of us, the faculty, and is a problem solver. And when something goes wrong, we can go, Mar, help. And Mar has been given the Staff Recognition Award for the Cinema School and also the Staff Recogni Recognition Award from the university. And the university described him as the backbone of the John C. Hinch Division of Animation and Digital Arts, but I think of Marta as our beating heart. And it's a beating heart that's full of love and generosity and compassion. And truly, you know, in, when times are dark, like they are these days, it's so helpful to walk in and see Mar. And Mar always says, I'm glad you're here. I appreciate you. He's, and so Mar, I want to say to you, I'm glad you're here. I appreciate you, and I love you, and we all are glad you're here, and we appreciate you, and we truly love you. Thank you. Thank you. students visit, I usually tell them, I want you to sit down on that seat and I want you to do nothing. Just do nothing. You can close your eyes or look at everything in my office because it's so full of detail. But please don't think of anything. Don't do anything. I feel like doing that now for the next 40 minutes but that's gonna to be too much. <laughs> Let me thank the people who put this together. Um, you know, Chaplain Bright, Reverend Jim, the good people of the Office of Religious and Spiritual Life, the people who are documenting this so that others can see it who are not here. My colleagues from my School of Cinematic Arts who uh, nominated me, so that Daphne nominated me, and then the others said, yes, let's do that. And then I think I have my friends from the school here. And there are some of you who probably have never have not met me yet, except today. Thank you for coming and uh, listening to my story. Now, uh, this is a special time for me because it's what I call the number five in the 12 step process, the 12 steps. I don't know if you're familiar with the 12 steps. It's a process to recover spiritually, uh, mentally, emotionally. And number five is very simple. It's sharing with somebody, another human being, uh, your sorrows, your joys, your shortcomings. At the same time, you're sharing it with what you believe, you must believe, if you want to, is what we call the higher power. So this is something like that. It's like a sharing, and it's very important. And uh, what I, what I will do is I will tell you about myself, but really what has occurred to me is that it's not me that will be speaking or talking, it's really all of you, because I see myself now in just about everything around me. And I know it's kind of maybe strange to think that way, but it's not for me. And for some spiritual traditions, that is the goal, is to see yourself in everything around you. And that way, in that way, you will never be lost. How can you be lost if you find yourself in everything that you encounter? I don't think you'll be lost. You'll be happy, content where you are. And fear will not be that monster that hangs over you all the time. And in our time, that is so difficult. It is so difficult. And that is the burden that we carry, most of us. 
All right. In the course of this talk, and what I'm about to say, you will further understand why I, why I look like this, and why I talk like this. You will get to see me more. Plato had this analogy, it's called the cave. And it's beautiful because it teaches me this lesson. As we see each other, we will perhaps only know each other as shadows on the wall. And the reality of our lives is yet to be discovered, hidden for us to discover as we spend time with each other. So hopefully the shadow that I am on the wall of your consciousness will, will have more detail after this and I will get to know you more because as I'm speaking, I'm trying to feel what you're thinking. What is it that you're thinking? What are you feeling? I know that's very hard to do. It's really very hard to do, but it's something that I remember every time I talk now. I cannot be talking to myself because I do that all the time. When I'm with people, I have to know, perhaps somehow, connect to what they're thinking and feeling. What matters to me and why? My name, your name, this is so important. And in our work and in our lives, it's so hard to remember that. In my work, I deal with 100 students. How is it possible to remember their names? It's very difficult. But I can remember their person, their personality. When they show up, I must remember uh, to smile, to greet them, to greet that, that person that's standing in front of me. Again, it's very hard because every day there are all these things that you have to do. The person shows up and then you're still thinking of your problem, but the person's there wanting to make a connection. And that other person, as I well know, will know exactly if you're connected or connecting with them. They will know and they will have their feeling and they will either feel welcomed or rejected in a small way, in a small way. So it's this daily struggle to be outside of myself, to remember somebody's name. For instance, let's take my name, Mariano Ramos Elapano III. When I was given that name as a child, I didn't like it very much because during that time, there was a famous comedian from the Philippines where I'm from, and he was very funny. He shaved his head and everybody called me that name, Mariano. And I said, I am not funny. I am not that funny comedian. I didn't like it in the beginning. And then later I realized it's the name of a person that I admire very much, the Virgin Mary. I'm a Catholic. And the Virgin Mary, Mary, the historical figure, is very important in my belief. I am named after her. I am the male version of Maria, Mariano. And I have a student, she has that name. She's from Saudi Arabia. And her name is Mariam. And in Arabic, that means Mary. It's a beautiful name. And it's given to me, it's the name of my grandfather. Not my father, I'm the middle child, so they named me after my grandfather. That's why I'm the third. And I dropped that for the longest time because what? Why do I need to tell people I'm number three in this long line of Marianos from the Philippines? Would they care? <laughs> to me, it's important now because now I have a son, two years old. He was just here. And my good wife decided to call him the fourth. Mariano, he's also a Mariano. He'll be number four. But his other name is John. You can call him Jack. So I call him Jack. I call him Jack. Hey, Jack, how old are you? It's beautiful. So what matters to me is your name. And often, I think my students know this. Tell me your name again. Before, I was so shy about that. It's like uh, if I forgot somebody's name, I wouldn't ask them. But now I let go. I said, look, I'm sorry. I need to know your name again. And they would 
probably be thinking, Mom, wow, you've seen me so many times. Can't you remember my name? I'm sorry. No. But I have to know. I have to say it right. But I'm curious now. What does your name mean? I have a student from China. I said, my name is Shin Rei. I said, Shin Rei. What does that mean? Ma, it means four times the heart. This is one, two, three, and Shin Rei. And she did this to me. One, two, three, Shin Rei. I said, that's beautiful. You mean you have love that's four times. Yeah. So it matters to me. What matters to me is the person's name. That's their treasure. I have to know that. And for some of us, you know, we don't like our names. We come up with another name. That's fine. That is our handle. That's our identity. To remember what matters to me, I have to remember. I have to remember because to remember is to make the love that we have for each other live again. Two weeks ago, we had the inauguration of our president, new president, Dr. Paul, and one of the speakers that really impressed me was our mayor, <laughs> Mayor Garcetti. I did not know, when he spoke, he spoke like a poet. He spoke like a poet. He said, we're standing on the precipice of possibilities. And there are three important things in life. And this is from another poet. He said, he admitted, one is to live. The second is to love. The third is to understand. And I listened to him and I said, I always thought that. But in this way, to live is to love. And to remember, to remember is to keep this love alive all the time. And I said, wow, we, we understand each other. Mayor Garcetti, wow, you're quite a poet yourself. I didn't say that. I didn't shout that during the speech. Okay. So what does that mean? Well, you know, our time together is always short. Soon, in another 20 minutes, 30 minutes, we will separate. And the only thing left of whatever happened between you and I is this moment. Now, how important is this moment? It depends how present we were as we were speaking and thinking of each other, looking at each other's eyes. So it's important to remember, to remember. And most of all, to create a ritual of remembrance. How do you do that? Well, you're seeing it right now. What do you mean, Mar? Well, these are the clothes of my teacher. My teacher, my art teacher, Jean Cole. These are his clothes. His good wife, his widow, gave it all to me. He said, Mark, look at this jeans closet. I don't want to give it to Goodwill. I'd like you to have this, including the hat, this hat. I said, good. Uh, this is great. In the beginning, it was about narcissism. It's like, wow, don't I look good? Uh, <laughs> no. Every morning when I go to work, I'm able to think about him. And he's my art teacher. He's giving me this lesson. Look, this is my jacket, Mark, this is brown. And this is my tie, and this is my shirt. Now, how do you put it together? And I do. And it comes, you know, it comes. And it seems that every time I do this, I'm with him. And I'm learning from him. He's talking to me, and I'm talking to him. See, how do you like this? And I add my own little things, which is what he would want, right? He would want that. Look, a teacher is a guy. You don't have to follow. In fact, you shouldn't follow everything I say. I give you these things. You work with it. And if you do something different, I would be so pleased. Don't imitate me. That's the last thing you would want. That is the last thing I would want. And so yes, there's this ritual. And then I elaborated on that. I carry this. You're kind of wondering, are you a smoker? No, this is just an icon. It's a prop. What I do, though, is I put uh, weed. I don't, I don't mean cannabis. I put rosemary. And I, I put uh, basil. I put it inside. And I taste it. And it's really delicious. And there's so much of that in our campus. You just walk around, and you will see rosemary bushes. And you will do this. And then I realized, look, 
in our minds, we have these icons that we experience as we grow up, as we watch a lot of moving images. And this is one of them. The hat, with the pipe, with the jacket, with the tie, with the buttoneer, and the pocket handkerchief. And then you can create this image. You move to your community, and they would have this vision of you. Who are you? And for some, it brings a little bit of joy because it recalls a time that was happy for them, a time that is special. For me, especially in my school of cinematic arts, the best decade or decades of filmmaking were in the 40s and the 50s. And this is what the characters look like. I know there will be good films to be made in the coming years. But it's such a special time for us who are interested in that particular aspect of filmmaking. So the ritual of remembrance. And then it becomes deeper. Because lately I have been going to church to our Savior. I'm a Catholic. I was a wayward Catholic for the longest time. And it's only around the time that when my children were born that I got closer to my faith. So it's hard for me to go to church on Sundays because I have to take care of my kids. But it's possible for me during the week to go immediately to our Savior. And even for 15 minutes, 16 minutes, engage, perform, and celebrate the ritual of remembrance. We remember who we are, that we are failures, perhaps. We are sinners. And there's a way to redeem ourselves. That's what I experience each time. And there is this beautiful ritual called the Eucharist. And it's kind of like what we're doing. There's a room, and there's food. And then there's meaning now when you eat it. Something like that. And every time there's the Eucharist, it comes to me, this whole renewal, regeneration, recovery. And I realized that's what it's about. That's why the Mass is so important for Catholics, because they renew it each time. Because we are so weak, and we forget so often what we want, what we're supposed to be. That's why this reminder, this ritual of remembrance is so important. And I worry, because who wants to become a priest nowadays? Who wants to become a nun? The religious orders, the people who dedicate their lives to that mission are getting less and less. The generation of priests and nuns is getting smaller and smaller. It's kind of like an endangered species. So to me, that's a concern. But perhaps not. There might be something that will happen that will allow for more people to join and make that connection. I don't know. It's fine for me right now. The ritual of remembrance is so important. What matters to me and why? And here, it's going to be very difficult because I'm here now. I will tell you something that's very important to me that affected my life so much. It's important to grieve, to weep, and to say goodbye. It's so important. And for the longest time, because of my upbringing, I did not know how. It's not what I should be. I shouldn't be crying. I should be strong. It's very common in societies for men, even the women, to be given that burden. And for the longest time, it hurt me. It hurt me. Uh, I'll tell you. Uh, my mother, I will talk about my mother. And I saw her in my mind. I remember now. She, she wept three times. And each time she wept, I didn't understand what it was about. I did not know what to do. The first time I see her uh, weep is when my, my younger brother was seriously ill. He could have died. And I just saw her quietly weeping. And I saw my brother. I looked at my younger brother, who I, I love dearly. He's old now, like me. I saw him in his eyes. He had this high fever that burned the skin underneath his eyes and on, on his eyelids. 
but I didn't know what to do. The second time was when my, my, my grandmother, the mother of my mother died and I was in the car with my mother and she was silently weeping and she held my hand. I was like a middle school kid. And she held my, my hand and I didn't know what to do. How do I comfort my mother who's weeping? I did not. I was sort of frozen. And then the other time was when we came here. I came here in 75 to study as a student with my brother. My mother visited us for the last time the following year and spent a month with us. As she said goodbye at the airport at LAX, she said goodbye to me. But then she said goodbye to my brother. She hugged him and she started weeping. And again, I was frozen. I didn't know what to do. I did not. And I knew that there was some kind of problem. There was some kind of problem. But I did not want to acknowledge it. To me, I could keep going. I'm fine. I am my own person. And finally, when she died, she died in the Philippines, I was here. I flew back. And there's this ceremony, it's called the last goodbyes where the casket is open and you say goodbye to the person. I went and I kissed her on the forehead. And when my lips touched her forehead, it was so cold. And it gave me the strangest feeling of all. Why is this like this? Later that night, we had dinner and the family was talking, and then they said, you know, your older brother, he was weeping. He was weeping. And I said to myself, why? Well, I guess he, he can weep all he wants, but you know, that's me. I, I don't weep. I don't. So there was this frozen uh, heart that I had at that time. I carried it for the longest time. And then in 2016, my friend, the widow of my teacher, Jean Cole, she lay dying for 20 days because it was in her will. She had this condition, she had a stroke, and in her will, you will let me die. You will let me die in comfort, you will not feed me. That was in her will. So 20 days, I visited her four times. And the fourth time I visited her, I held her hand, I whispered prayers, and suddenly, I started weeping. It was, I was weeping. And I don't know how long, it could have been an hour. I lost track of time. And the gentle nurse tapped my shoulder and he said, it's all right, it's all right. And then at that moment, later I realized I have wept for all the people I love in my life who are not here anymore who I cannot be with anymore, who perhaps I owe an, an apology to. I have learned to grieve, to weep. I have learned to do that. And it was only recently that I was able to. And it's such a gift. And please, to all of you, you're all my friends now, now that I have shared this with you, please take time to grieve. It's necessary, it's important. And when you do that, when you do that, make and create some sort of ritual of remembrance. And that way, when you grieve again, you will have some sort of handle. Because the grieving will not go away. It will be there for us all the time. That's part of who we are. But then you will have this ritual where you can always say, look, I miss you, I love you. And if you want, you can make a mess. You can say, I am sorry, but I was that kind of a person. Now that, and you can say this too, you can probably see me now. What do you think? I can say that right now to my mom. Mom, what do you think? You used to call me the hunchback because my posture was so bad. You used to call me ugly. She didn't really call me that. <laughs> but I felt that though, I felt that, because her favorite was my younger brother, and my dad's favorite was my older brother. He named him after. I was named after my grandfather. That's fine. That is fine. To grieve and to say goodbye.
to breathe, breathing and saying goodbye, to say goodbye, to say, look, it's done, it's there, and it cannot be changed anymore. It cannot be changed anymore. And now we have this opportunity to do other things. People call it moving forward. It's, to me, it's just being in your act of being. You're here. Why do you have to be afraid? Why do you have to hang on when it's your actual being that will allow you to be free? It will allow you to be free, to grow. It's so hard to do that in our time. We get so attached to all these things. We feel that if we do not have it, something so awful will happen to us. What could that be? We just be grumpy and resentful. That's the awful thing. And then we drive away people who want to be with us. They want to be with us. But then because of that feeling that they get from you, joy of just being, you know, just, I'm here. I am just here. I am happy to be here. To grieve, to say goodbye. It's so important. And I hope, I hope we can keep doing this, all of us, all the time, every time. And that's what I try to do. I guess for those of you who email with me, you're kind of wondering, what's the matter with this part? It always starts with dear and the name, right? The name's so important, right? And then he says, thank you. What's he thanking me for? I think he wants something. <laughs> <laughs> or I hope you're well, or good morning. And I always try to end with a dollar thank you. I think you notice that. And then there's always the greeting at the end, the, the salutation. It's called another ritual of remembrance. Each of these things are rituals of remembrance. The greeting that we see, that we give in our emails, these are rituals of remembrance. And I always say now, I used to say peace and goodwill, peace and goodwill, I always say that. And my wife is kind of worried. Why don't you think that people will think you're some kind of hippie? <laughs> By saying that all the time? I said, and I have to, to decide. I will make a choice, no. What people think is their business. What I feel and what I think is going to be mine. This is who I am. This is my ritual of remembrance. I rem I'm remembering them as good people, as people that I want to wish goodwill to, even though sometimes I don't, because I don't feel that way all the time, but I will act as if that is the, where I want to go, because that's really where I want to go. And lately, I've changed it. Instead of saying peace and goodwill, I say, Pax et bonum. That's Latin. Now you're kind of wondering, is he showing off? What's this thing? He always does this with languages. No, it's a ritual of remembrance because Pax et bonum is the motto of my high school. I went to a Catholic high school and they were run by Franciscan monks. They were monks from Spain. They were wearing these heavy robes in tropical heat and they had beards and a lot of hair on their arms. <laughs> but they, they gave me this education, they gave me this culture, this memory. And I remember we would wear a patch that said, Pax et Bonum, which means peace and goodwill. So it's my ritual of remembrance. I remember my high school. What a time. I suffered, I was bullied. But then I learned things and I made friends and I lost them. And then I became a person because of my time there. And I left the Philippines in 1975, and I came here. And I have been here ever since. I'm wearing a watch, a ritual of remembrance. And in the back it says, 35 years of service. And I asked my initials to be put on it, M-A-R. My, my goal is to give it to my son, Jack. Jack, this is for you. You can throw it away, but I want you to know. <laughs> I want you to know that I thought of you when I got this. I'm thinking of staying another five years, so it'll be 40 years. And what happens is they allow you to have another watch. <laughs> and this time we will say, 40 years, Mahar. And that I will give to my daughter, Gwen. I will say, Gwen, this is for you. 
you, you can throw it away if you want. But again, <laughs> I thought of you when I ordered this watch. Why 40 years later for my daughter? Because she arrived first. You know, she arrived first. She was, she went in, she went out into the world first, and then my son followed. So she was sort of older by a minute or so. So she's the 40 years, and my Jack is the 35 years. That's how I calculated him, my friend. Soon we will be running out of time. So one more thing, what's important to me and why? To celebrate, to laugh, to laugh, to make jokes, to sing, to dance. I think I brought a prop. See, I have my pipe, but I don't smoke. I have a guitar, but I don't really play it. <laughs> but see, but the moment you see me and the moment you hear this, something comes alive in your mind, right? You make all these associations of all of these things, but perhaps a lovely, warm and gentle. And that's the whole point of this. When I go out there and I'm with people, because I'm very happy now when I'm with people. Before I was very isolated, you know, oh, I don't care. I'm better than you. No. You, you are my poem. You are my poem. And in fact, I would recite that poem by Walt Whitman. I probably recite it holding this guitar and strumming it. Walt Whitman, you know about Walt Whitman, right? American poet. And I was going through old issues of National Geographic, and there was a special on him. And then there was this poem that he wrote. It's called To You, To You. And I probably end my presentation with this poem. Whoever you are, I put my hand upon you so that you will be my poem. I whisper with my lips close to your ear. I have loved many women and men, but I have loved none better than you. kind of that happens every time we meet because after meeting we will separate right so this is probably how we'll end it roads roads go on while we forget or are forgotten like a star that shoots and is gone they are lovely as we sleep lovelier for lack of the traveler, who is now a dream only. You are all my poems. You will be in my dreams. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, thank you. All right, um, I guess this is just a silly question, but you brought, what, two props today. Um, I'm curious, how many more props do you have in your <laughs> cabinet? I would like to invite all of you here to visit my office, because that way you will get an idea of how many props I have. To my mind, it's like this, and it's something, a tool that you could use also, all right? 
everything you find in the course of your explorations will be useful. It's the way you see it. I would stop and pick something up that was discarded and say, this is lovely, because it is. It had a purpose. And other people thought, you're not helping me anymore, so I would put you down this way. But everything that surrounds us has a purpose. Even the cockroach in the basement of the laundry room in my condo. <laughs> you know, I, I used to be crazy. I had this obsession, I'm going to kill every cockroach that I find. But I don't do that anymore. When I see it, I say, look, go about your business. Don't bother me. <laughs> I did that one time at the laundromat, and this cockroach stared at me. I said, look, go about your business. I have no cause to kill you right now. You know, I, it, and then as I was moving around, it started following me. It sensed the vibe I gave it. But that's the way it is, you know. It's the way we see things and the way we, we perceive things around us. It can be that if you want. So there's nothing, I find in everything I see, there's, some, there's a purpose to this. What is this? So I make this connection. And then I realize that is the artist in all of us. We make these connections where usually there isn't any. And people find it strange most of the time, but I don't. Because I know now it's part of my desire to create art. That to me is creating art. To make these connections, to have new meaning, and to somehow give it back to the world. Look, world, this, this is what I found out. And it's so satisfying. It really is. Hi, Mar. Hello. How are you? Okay, thank you. <laughs> oh, yes, hello. Sir. What's your process in order to see yourself and everyone? What, how do you get there? That's a hard thing to do. I think the, be the first thing, perhaps, to remember is just to, to let go, you know, because for the most part, we're always concerned with, with us, with me, what am I gonna do? The eye is always in there, you know, and the best part of my day is riding the bus to work. It starts with lining up, get on the bus, and, and you see all these people, and it could be a nuisance, right? Oh, all these people getting on the bus. And I just look at them and try to smile and enjoy their presence. And then you get up, you greet the bus driver, you take your seat, and you just be with everybody there. This is a hard thing to do, by the way, especially where I sit. I sit all the way in the back. And usually in the back is where they smoke, you can smell it. And then they eat, and then they play music, and some people who have burdens are there, and they show it, you know? But it's fine, and it's part of, I accept it. I know that you're having a hard time. I hope it ends and you get some rest. You know, I say that in my mind. So I'm thinking about the people most of the time that I'm with, as I am trying to do now. And, uh, and I know it's a hard thing to do, believe me, it's so hard. Uh, and I think what helps is doing nothing. You just sit there, do nothing. Please, sit there, do nothing. Think of nothing, just sit there. Because the silence, you listen to the silence, and it will speak to you. That's why people go to the desert. Because in the desert, you can find this beautiful silence. And you're afraid that you're going to get killed or you're gonna die of hunger and thirst. But no, just go there and do nothing, be part of the desert. It's very hard to do, but for thousands of years, that's what people who try to have spiritual lives, that's what they did. I kind of wondered about that. Why would you want to go to the desert for 40 days? What's in there? Isn't it boring? No, it's not. It's one of the richest experiences, perhaps. But it's not easy. It's not easy. Um, how did you overcome the um, idea of you were, since you were the middle child, 
that your father and mother still felt that you were special, even though you felt that they favored your oldest and younger? Oh, thank you very much for asking that question. I am the middle child, and I felt left out a lot of the time, and, and I felt, told myself, I denied it. I said, did that not bother me? I'm fine, but no, it, it hurt me. It hurt me. But then I realized, and here's the most important part, I realized when my children were born, I realized through them how my father and mother loved me so much. And this is how I put it together. Every time I take my child, caress it, care for it, whisper to it, and tell it that I love you, dear child. It's actually my mother and my father doing that to me when I was a baby. I finally made that connection that they gave me all this caring and love that allowed me now to give it to my children. And I was afraid, you know, they never really loved me. They loved my brothers more than me. No, that's not true. They gave me the love that I needed. And it shows in the love and caring that I gave my children now. It's really a gift to have kids. And I know not all of us will have kids, right? That's fine, because all of us will have the chance, if we want to, to be connected to the other person through empathy. And that's available to all of us. It's just a matter of choice. Can I forget myself and be with you? Can I be with you when we're together? Which is essentially what happens in parenting. Can I be with you, child, when we're together? instead of looking at my smartphone while you're beside me. That's the story. That's why, you know, I have to be, not just with my child, but with every person that I meet now, I have to be with you, you know? I, I cannot be that person. Although it's very hard, I understand. I cannot be that person whose mind is somewhere else. And I was telling Chaplain Brake, we know when that happens. When you're talking to a person, you know, you know they're not listening to me. You can feel it. You can feel that, oh, I, they're not with me not right now. You feel rejected. There'll be a time when there'll be less of that. We can all do it, right? We can all be with each other. We can all do that. All right. Um, um, we're going to, we're, uh, at the top of the hour, um, but Mar will be here um, yeah, at the end, so right, yeah. you can answer questions one-on-one. -on -one. But uh, on behalf of the Office of Religious and Spiritual Life and your Trojan family, I wanted to give you a small gift um, so you can continue to document what matters to you and why, oh, you. and then to share it with us all. <laughs> but um, thank you so much, Mar, for uh, presenting today. Thank you. Thank you.